Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are coming to you from our temporary encampment, sharing space with a bunch of sewing machines in the Millennium Library's Idea Mill. Did you know that we are in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation? It's also known as Treaty 1 territory. Did you know our drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Station and Treaty 3 territory? Did you know that in this episode, we will be discussing The Sisters Brothers by Patrick DeWitt? Are you wondering why everything is framed as a question in this intro? <laughs> I am too. <laughs> I'm Trevor Lockhart, proprietor of the general store of knowledge known as the Louis Riel Library. <laughs> and to my left is... Hi, I'm Kirsten Get Your Gun. Wow. Huh? I just thought of that on the fly. From uh, Harvey Smith Library. And to my left is... Hi, I'm Erica Ball. I stake my claim at Fort Gary Library. And to my left is... Hi, I'm Dennis. I normally work in the Idea Mill, but we're still closed at the moment, so I've been hanging out at the Henderson Gulch. (laughs) (laughs) Please don't write any reproachful letters to the Chamber of Congress. dear readers, it wouldn't be nearly as fun without you. It's your questions and comments that form the heart of our discussions. Email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca. Leave a comment on our website, wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca, or find us in our other many varied social media forums. Find out if your comments made it on air by subscribing to Time to Read on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and other fine podcasting and social media services. In a moment, Kirsten will start us off by giving us a brief bio of Patrick DeWitt, followed by Erica, who will spoil everything with a brief synopsis. Don't forget to stick around to the end for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. Kirsten, over to you. All right. I think we should stop saying brief bio just because, you know, I'm never, I'm never keeping it to the brief, but thought, I'm not going super long. I thought this, taking but, that out, but you yeah. know, it's a template. I, 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 I like to, you know. <laughs> it's the problem with a template. It could be longer. Yeah, it will be. Yes. Okay. Uh, Patrick DeWitt, born on Vancouver Island, 1975, currently lives in Portland, Oregon. And I should say that a lot of this information that I have in the bio actually comes from a Guardian article written a few years back when he was interviewed by Susanna Russell. And he is a great interviewee. Like, there are so many great interviews with him. He is a novelist, short story writer, and screenwriter. At the age of seven, he wrote a secret country song called All Those Old Time Girls, Mm. as seven-year-olds would, Mm, you know. (laughs) Known for his highly stylized prose for comic effect, which is how he actually speaks in real life. He Mm. uses a very quaint vocabulary with words like quaint (laughs) and malady. He was raised in a home with parents who loved to read, but he nonetheless did not do well within the school system and he dropped out before graduation. He has a tattoo of a lighthouse on his forearm from a time when he thought a lighthouse keeper was the only job he could think of that he might like to do. Mm. Me too. I still fantasize yeah. about that. So similar, similar, actually, to writer, I yes. have, yeah. I, I, similar to a librarian too. I mean, he was, I have a theory about lighthouse keepers, but you do. We, well, we'll see what happens. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to make a note. <laughs> Maybe for the show notes. <laughs> we'll circle back. <laughs> he didn't want to do what it seemed to him that all adults do, which was work at jobs they loathe. Mm. Another part of his quaint vocabulary, loathe. Mm. He was working in a bar in L.A. when he began studying the novels he liked to read in order to figure out how they worked. He began to write character impressions of the folks he served at the bar, and he wrote his first book, Ablutions, which, as some of you might remember, was my nerd word from a couple of years back. (laughs) Was that the changeling? Because Seb said you mentioned the Sisters Brothers in an old episode. That oh, I, I yes, and I've mentioned Sisters Brothers, yes. Um, oh, okay. But Ablutions, I think, was in our live oh. um, episode at the uh, conference. Oh. <clears throat> anyway, Patrick DeWitt describes that in the beginning when he was writing, story or plot actually held no importance for him. Mm-hmm. He prized overall voice and dialogue. 
He gave that first novel to a bar customer to read, who happened to be a screenwriter. It was L.A. after all. <laughs> who then gave it to another friend, a musician, who used to be in a band with another guy who became a literary agent. And this literary agent eventually called DeWitt and signed a book deal. So Ablutions got great reviews, but no one actually really bought it. DeWitt then decided to focus more on plot and story and mm -hmm. began writing his second novel, The Sisters Brothers, which he has said changed him as a writer in that he was still interested in creating beautifully constructed prose and dialogue, but now he was also fascinated about creating a page turner. He has what he calls a belligerent attitude towards the establishment. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally going <laughs> to cross stitch. Um, <laughs> And he calls himself a bit of a voyeur and an eavesdropper when in public. I like this so guy. Yeah. <laughs> he observes humanity. Yep. And just finally, this, this is what he, he says about himself as a writer. If I think of myself as writing in any tradition, it's maybe a tradition of people interested in upsetting tradition, usurping a genre, or even kicking it in the teeth. I'm making it sound meaner than I feel in my heart, he says. It's a very youthful, gleeful feeling, like drawing a mustache on a beautiful painting. There's a touch of the vandal in it. Mm. So that's Patrick DeWitt. I mean, that makes so much sense. I was just going to say, especially in terms of this book's relationship to the Western genre, mm -hmm. people keep trying to paint it as a Western or yeah. saying it's revitalizing Westerns. And I'm like, it's kind of turning it on its head. Yeah. <laughs> but also his love of language mm -hmm. and yeah. voice, because that's something that spoke to me every single time I went through this book uh, is just. The, the use of language and the vocabulary and the style and the way you dip into the characters, that just fits so well with yeah. what you're saying about his interview. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. Well, before we get too far into it, oh, why, don't, why don't we let Erica tell <laughs> us a little yep. bit about what we're about to talk about? <laughs> sure. So this is adapted from the publisher blurb. Herman Kermit Warm, I mean, great name, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> totally. Is about to die. The enigmatic and powerful man known only as the Commodore has ordered it and hired Eli and Charlie's sisters to see it done. The sisters' brothers are notorious killers, but Eli has begun to question what he does for a living and whom he does it for. As they embark on what may well be their last job, they find their prey isn't an easy mark, and on the road from Oregon City to Sacramento, California, they encounter no end of adventure, cheaters, and ne'er-do-wells in a violent, lustful odyssey of the 1850s frontier that beautifully captures the humor, melancholy, and grit of the Old West. Very accurate. There it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No spoilers. Yeah, none. <laughs> no, but I think it, it definitely gives the uh, the listener who hasn't read it a bit of an idea of mm -hmm. the, the overall picture. But uh, you know, I'm going to tell you guys. I don't know if I liked it. <gasps> oh. Really? Uh, and I realized <laughs> that it's won a bunch of awards and yeah. I'm in the minority around this table and probably in the community. And mm -hmm. uh, so I am here today to listen to what you guys have to say. And I'm going to set my little table with a sign that says, change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's surprising to me um, because it's like a first person yeah, narrative it's su male. It's like. surprising <laughs> to me too. I, or should I say, I wanted to like it more than I did. Mm -hmm. And I like parts of it, but as a whole, I did not. But, was it too uh, violent? Interesting. No, no, it okay, wasn't sorry, too. No, it was okay. I know no, you're a sensitive in... soul. Well, yeah, no, I, I, I don't. Well, uh... as, as was Eli. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Although, if I can say, like, uh, I originally read this book many years ago. Uh, not long after it had come out, uh, I was working in outreach at the time. The large type copy came through, so I was reading that. And at the time I first read it, I didn't know how I felt about it that much either. It was like, it was interesting. I liked the language. I wasn't entirely sure if I was satisfied with the conclusion of the story, especially. Reading it through this time was a different experience. So I don't know if it's maybe it's one of those books that maybe benefits from multiple readings. Mm -hmm. But um, That's fair. That's an interesting point because I read it as well, I think, when it first came out. And I really liked it. I mean, I think I've talked about it already. Because it also so it surprised me so much that mm -hmm. it was this Western and it was so male dominated. Mm. I don't yeah. normally like books like that. Mm. Um, and I liked it. And then, and I'm no, normally not a rereader. Mm. Even the books that I've read for this 
podcast and then reread. Eh, I don't really reread. I reread this book and I enjoyed it so much. And I don't know if it really, because you sort of know what's going to happen. And so you can just really just like envelop yourself in the dialogue. Would you and, say, would you say you enjoyed it more the second time than the first, or was it just a different experience reading it the two times? I feel like I maybe enjoyed it more because I was like, oh my gosh, I like this book so much. Mm, I'm mm. really, yeah, yeah. I think it might be one of those you need to come at in the right mood. Mm. Um, I tried to read it. It's one of those that I've been wanting to read for a long time. And sometimes I'll pick up something. It's not what I feel like reading and I'll put it down. So that's what I did with this one. I think I only read about the first chapter and then I got, I went on to read something else. And this time I, I'm, it, this was a, the book that I read accidentally when I was trying to read something else. Like ah. I picked it up, I opened it and I just sort of like fell into it. Ah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, before I, I just wasn't in the right headspace to go with it, mm -hmm. but this time for sure. Yeah, I thought it felt it very easy. I will say, into. like, this one, like, when we talk about it in, as a genre book, right, which is, you know, it's a Western. It's mm. cataloged as a Western, most uh, mostly. But when I was reading through it, one of the impressions I got, it was kind of like a Homeric epic. It was an Odyssey. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like our heroes are going along and they keep yeah. having these encounters and some of them are really weird and seem like kind they would be magical. symbolic yeah yes. yeah mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. they, they seem very much well. like symbolic retellings and mm -hmm. you know things like the old woman's hut where yeah. uh, there was that thing about the threshold and they didn't want to cross it and then eli does to save his horse yeah. and uh then after that you know they encounters that weird girl who right. poisoned the dog and yeah. she talks she about dream. him being protected yes. and it's like protected like what is this yeah. and no one will tell him and it mm -hmm. feels very much like a like a dream sequence yeah. or mm -hmm. like a ancient epic. Yeah, and, th and those little sections were called intermissions too. Yeah. And one yeah. was at the very, almost at the very end, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which was like, uh, you know, but it's interesting though. I, I'm glad you brought up the- <laughs> That annoyed you. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> and I loved it, okay. so. And, and you know what? This is going to make me seem shallow. You're not, no, supposed you to, you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover. Oh, right? I love the, uh, this cover? But, yes, but, but I'm, uh, I'm also like the title confused me. <laughs> yeah, like uh, sisters, brothers, and looking at the cover that we have. Now, there are many covers because Kristen yeah. found a ton of covers for mm -hmm. our Facebook page. But the one that I'm talking about is the red cover that has the moon and it has the titular brothers on the front kind of stylized where they're holding guns uh, out at you. And from a distance, it looks like uh, a skull. Mm -hmm. But from an even further distance, a friend said to me, are, what are you, what's that book you're reading with the panda on the front? <laughs> oh. uh, and it does kind of look a little bit like a panda from afar. So, I mean, that put me off right from the beginning, <laughs> the title and, and the cover. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also, I, I, go ahead. No, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, this is just before, before you actually say what's actually happening, I'm going to guess that something about a person rebelling for no particular reason and being provocative isn't your bag. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair because the other thing, and and it's interesting because we have some discussion questions that we put on social media and they're, and they're great because they encompass, they're based on the book, but they, they also allow you to think about things outside and they're real they really make you think. They make me think anyway. And so, for example, the first question we put out was, this book has been described as an upending, which is in quotations, of the Western genre. Are you a fan of the Western? Why? And if not, how would it have to be upended to pique your interest? Now, I, 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 I struggled with this question because mm -hmm. I was trying to think, well, how did it upend the Western? Like, wasn't it, wasn't it a Western? And uh, what, what Dennis said about uh, mythology, I thought, really made sense because like the Western is more than a genre. It, it is a mythology, right? The whole idea of the American West and it was like the civil war and the civil war ended and there was this place, this mythical place out West and the, and, and the characters are larger than life. The, the heroes are heroic. The, the villains are notorious, but there's always this gray area of people that can go and redefine themselves as being something that they weren't before. And I feel like there was a lot of I think a lot of times Westerns get maligned for being very black and white. And the, those old movies where there's like the white hat and, and the, the, it's the good guy in the black hat. But a lot of Westerns, even the older original ones, are written with a lot of uh, ambiguity and, and, and complex. So I, I didn't find it upended at all. I, I thought it felt solidly in the Western genre. But uh, I read I read something interesting about that, which because I had the same kind of question. Like I thought maybe the upending might be the the kind of the way it was literary or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But someone who was reviewing the movie actually, uh, rather than the book, was saying that one thing that stood out about this as a western is that Eli, as a narrator, 
is extremely vulnerable. Yes. And he talks openly about feeling shame and mm-hmm. about his feelings yeah. and coping with them and trying to deal with the feelings that arise out of his relationship with his, his brother. And there's also the the friendship between Warm and Morris mm-hmm. that is like by the end of the book, those guys love each other. Mm-hmm. And it's not it's not a romantic love. It's not a, you know, like a homosexual love or a uh, I mean it may be. Well, it Who's might be, say? but it might be, but it's not. That doesn't come it's to the explicit. fore. Yeah. What yeah. comes to the fore is that they love each other yeah. in a big, open way, and they're not ashamed of it in any way. Mm-hmm. They're not. They don't have to make any excuses for it. They just love each other because they connected mentally and emotionally and spiritually, and however you want to describe it. And those are not typical of a western, because the the few westerns that I've read, the men are very macho. Mm-hmm. They are very masculine. They, uh, if you, you're gunning someone down, you know, you you don't feel shame afterwards and have to go off in a corner and do mm-hmm. what Eli did to calm down. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you don't have to find ways to cope. But yeah, it was very emotional and unashamed of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's true. My thought about that, based on absolutely nothing except for my own reaction, is that I feel like whoever decided to market it as a play on Western or as a homage to the Westerns and maybe this came from the other, I don't know, but I feel like it was more of a wishful thinking of what Westerns could become or like to be reinvented because Westerns Mm -hmm. were such a hugely popular genre that are gradually like losing their place to other genres and what with like genres becoming more mixed and all these new genres coming out. And especially it's, it's harder and harder to find a book that you will actually just be classified as a pure Western. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. The Western genre itself, I get the appeal of. I'm not the biggest fan of it in like actual, actual like reading purposes. I don't and know if I've ever actually themes, read a Western. And I think <laughs> that the themes now are a little bit insensitive to the times yes mm-hmm. because what Can you're be talking about is yeah. a is a whole genre of white men oppressing everybody else mm-hmm. and <laughs> the countryside yeah and starting to farm and like yay for them they're so tough they you know yeah. clear the trees and like it's like you know all right but when it's done like this and when i get to talk about my read alike it does have like a really evocative way to explore the themes of participating in something that you don't necessarily agree with but you're swept along by circumstance or by you know your own need to survive the way eli was and you know coming to realize that the life you're leading isn't necessarily how you want to be living you know and then major themes of life and death and morality and and friendship and love and blah 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 sorry i've been talking for a while but those are my no, thoughts on that no, but I, I, but yeah and i think uh, sometimes those questions do come up in westerns i don't yeah. know like i said i but this is very explicit here. Like yeah. Eli and Charlie have conversations mm-hmm. where Eli is saying, but the moral, like, yeah. why should we kill Warm? Yeah. He's not a bad person. The Commodore is the bad person. Yeah. yeah. And and that and, cool. and actually um that just makes me think about something that I had also read. Like, I don't think DeWitt really had always these plans to write a Western. Like, he talks about how he wrote this exchange between, um, this sort of testy exchange between two men on horseback. Um, One was self-doubting and very vulnerable, and one was very confident. Mm -hmm. And he just sort of wrote it. And then he was at a yard sale, and he found this, you know, one of those time books on the gold rush. And he was Mm -hmm. just leafing through it. And it made him remember that dialogue that he had written. And then he took the book home and then he tore out a picture of an old prospector and he put it on his wall. And then when he was writing the character of Warm, he kept looking at that photograph. Mm -hmm. But right at the time when he was writing The Sisters Brothers, he was about 30 pages in. He was also at the same time writing another book about a cult. (laughs) He was about 50 pages in. And I guess he sort of talked to his editor and he he just decided he'd go with the Western because he just thought it was maybe better. But then because I knew that, I sort of thought at some point, 
the way I read Charlie then, it's mm -hmm. almost like he was in the cult of the Commodore, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. yes. um, he was just willing to do anything for him. And then Eli was there to sort of be this kind of moral compass to say, let's get back to protect what's, him what's from all kinds right. of things. Right. Well, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Well, and, and that kind of ties into the relationship between the brothers. I was trying to summarize it for my notes to say like, okay, well, their relationship, you know, there's these aspects to it. And it's just, as I think through it, it's such a complicated relationship. Yeah. I, I started focusing on the beginning and how it's kind of like Charlie tends to be kind of abusive towards Eli and really control him with manipulation and, uh, and bullying. But at the same time, he clearly loves his brother and does things because because part, it seems because he thinks he needs to to protect him because Eli is much more naive than he is. And I mean, a lot of that goes back to when Charlie killed their father, father yeah. when Eli was too young to be really aware of it. But Eli is also protecting Charlie mm -hmm. and also loves him, but also hates so mm -hmm. many aspects of what he does. And I find I couldn't really summarize it. It's a uh, yeah, I can't even summarize what I'm thinking right now mm -hmm, because it's yeah. so intertwined. Yeah, there's a, there's a codependency there. Mm -hmm. yes. And there's also like the nature of their relationship speaks to how damaged they both are mm -hmm. yes. by what they... Do you think it does a disservice to the book to call it uh, a Western? No. No. no, but although I think lots of people might initially, like myself, be like, well, no, I'm not going to read it. It's a Western mm -hmm. because he was also not a well-known author at this time either. Like now I will read anything by Patrick DeWitt. <laughs> yeah. um, but at the time I didn't know who he was. And I, I just wanted to actually just read a couple of uh, comments to our Instagram page. Tara underscore Ellie said that she's not a Western fan, but really enjoyed this book. It was highly recommended by a coworker. And so I took a chance and I'm so glad I did. And I think that that like, that's why I read it. Cause mm. someone who I respected had said, you know what? I this was a really, really good book. And I was like, what? It's mm. a Western. <laughs> um, so, so Kirsten, shout mm. out to another Kirsten on Instagram, said, I've never really read Westerns or watched Western movies for that matter, but I read and enjoyed The Sisters Brothers. I liked Eli, the sensitive, overthinking brother. This is one quote I saved from the book. He stood there weeping and watching us go while behind him, Lucky Paul entered and collapsed in the prospector's tent. And I thought... There is another miserable mental image I will have to catalog and make room for. Hmm. That's mm -hmm. Eli saying yeah, that. There was yeah. just definitely so many yeah, terrible yeah. mental images. But I think that's sort of what I was getting at, that calling it a Western may be a barrier for many readers mm -hmm. because yeah. people have preconceived ideas of what a Western is. Uh, I think there are Westerns and there are Westerns, just like there are mysteries and there are mysteries. Like yeah. there's Louis L'Amour, yes. uh, which, you know, he cranked yeah. out a hundred and bajillion of them and they're all kind of the same story. Yeah. Uh, and then there's stories like this, or there's stories by um, like uh, True Grit by Charles Portis, which is another Western, but very complex, very nuanced. The main character is a young girl in it. And hmm. again, kind of maybe it upends the genre, if you want to use that term, but. This, it is cataloged as fiction. I think we have think a catalog so. both ways. Yeah, I think, oh. large, I think large print. It's a, oh, large it's, print it's is Western. always catalog yeah. weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we love I, our catalogers, by the way. Oh, yeah. Well, some of it isn't. It's uh, from yeah, them. it's vendors. Yeah, vendors. But we love our um, vendors. We love everybody. We also love our vendors. Please just keep selling us books. Mm -hmm. I think my prediction is that genres, I believe, have largely outlived their usefulness mm. as mm. a thing. I wouldn't be sad if we didn't worry yeah. about genre things yeah. anymore. Yeah. Uh, like, it's, well, is it well written? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I will say, though, I still have love for things that are clearly genre. Like I mentioned last time, I love cozy mysteries. And yeah. I'd like to be able to go to one shelf and just find cozy mysteries when I want a cozy but mystery. But it's not uh, <laughs> it, it's not cataloged as cozy mysteries. It's just exactly. cataloged no, as I, mysteries. So it's no, going to be next to your yeah. noir mysteries. Right. And yeah. like, what yeah. purpose does that serve? At, at, the, at the risk of perhaps profiling some of our customers, Western readers, to my experience, tend to be older men mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now who come in and just say, where are your Louis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, but do you think if you gave them the Sisters Brothers... Would the uh, hardcore only read westerns? Would what would they no, think of it? No, because it's not. It's not what if you're if you feel like reading a western, you're not going to be satisfied by that. You're no, going to be like, I, what was you, that? Maybe you would. Well, I, I don't know. I have a story related to this. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to have a patron at uh, one place that I worked that 
only read Westerns, but he ended up reading all of them. Mm. There were none yeah. left that he had not read. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking for something else for him to read. And we ended up in the romances. And from the, from the Westerns that I've read, they are essentially male romances. The ones that I've read, that's very much a love story, except that it focuses a lot on the macho man. Mm -hmm. And he ended up being a big fan of Daniel Steele and mm -hmm. Laverle Spencer and other yeah, authors like that. Sometimes into the inspirational because mm -hmm. uh, we the didn't same try at West, that point the point yeah, yeah. Yeah. and uh he connected with these very well and i don't think he would have initially because of the male female mm -hmm. expectation mm -hmm. western romance but they speak to a lot of the same themes mm -hmm. and he loved them and he kept reading and he read a ton of them and he was quite happy with them that's oh, also what, a great what a, a great story about um come and talk to your librarian that's um, right yeah. you know to, right. for, for recommendations yeah. but because, what a psychological yeah. barrier yeah. for a lot of people who wouldn't even pick up a romance yes. because it's yeah. a romance like yeah. just get rid well, of a thing yeah. yeah they're historical they're historical fiction yeah. mm -hmm. with exactly. some like love stuff in there you know, we could Maybe. probably uh, talk for the yeah, next three hours about, 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 about uh, this is the, our dang job, so. the dangers of genre. But <laughs> I would just like to get your guys' opinion of the idea of Eli's relationship with his horse tub. Mm -hmm. yeah, when, you, tub. You can, when you see it, uh, it, it's it's the, it's heartbreaking and, and lovely, and uh, and I did enjoy. I mean, that part of his relationship, and it was sort of almost a substitute for a human connection. Mm. Do you guys have any thoughts on that about maybe an, an animal or something that's not human <laughs> that comes? <in? laughs> <laughs> you don't have to share here. I mean, uh, I mean, our pets are very important, right? Like yeah. similar, yeah. You know, I, I have to say, like, as regards to pets, like, I, I have always had a complicated relationship with the idea of pets. Yeah. When I was younger, I, I kind of wanted to have a hamster. Like, when I moved out on my own, I, I thought I'd get a hamster. But the more I thought about it, the more I was like, am I just imprisoning a rodent and <laughs> for my own entertainment? Yeah. And I ended up not being able to Aww. do it because I... I I didn't feel like it was right. But then when I... It can go in those little balls, though, and then just, yeah. like, you know, run around the house. <laughs> That's right. But then my wife wanted to get a cat. This was before we got married. And I was like, well, it's her. She lived in a different place. It's like she could get a cat if she wanted. But because I spent so much time with her and I spent so much time with her cat, I ended up falling in love with the cat mm -hmm. as well and ended up recognizing... Like, I'd never thought of cats really as having a personality. Mm -hmm. And... You don't have to spend that much time with them before you start noticing it. And then once I was aware of that, I started becoming aware of the personality of so many animals. Like uh, this one place we used to go with Outreach, they had a bird. And I ended up being able to kind of understand what the bird wanted at different points. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when the bird wanted to ride on my shoulder, when it wanted to <laughs> connect. So I, I'm still not keen on the idea of like breeding animals for pets. But for animals that we rescue that like, you know, cats, there's so many, they, they would get end up getting put down if you don't adopt them. Yeah. Bringing them into your life that way is a kindness to them and ends up being a kindness to you. So the Eli's relationship with Tub and how, you know, he didn't want it, at the, didn't want Tub at the beginning. And by the end, he couldn't let him go. And I loved his line at the end too, where when he found Tub dead, he said, I thought... What a life it is for man's animals. What a trial of pain and endurance and senselessness. Mm -hmm. and I thought, yeah, because, you know, he clearly grew to love Tub, but he also didn't know how to care for him very well. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, after Tub's injury, it was like he was kind of doomed at that point. But on the other hand, if he had sold him or gotten rid of him, he would have been horse meat. Yeah. It was well, very complicated. That line, I kind of feel like Eli was talking about himself. Yeah. I feel like he's a lot of what he thought about Tub was what he was going through. He was like, Yeah, this life was, sucks. Yeah. I don't like it. They were both sort of misfits. I love my favorite, my favorite line about him and Tub. It was something about how Tub seemed to be trying really hard mm -hmm. to be like better. Yeah. <laughs> and it made him like him, like they like him right. even more. And I was like, That's so sweet. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, even the hand, you know, at, at that stable saw something in Tub, right? Yeah. That this is guy. yeah this is a special special personality hmm. when you were talking dennis that made me think i was listening to something on um i think it was sunday edition on cbc the other day and it was about this writer brian brett who wrote a, a memoir about his 25 years with his pet african gray parrot right. mm -hmm. yeah. and it was such a great interview and it was just so heartfelt 
felt. And he said, like, he doesn't think that he owned this parrot. Like, they had a relationship. Like, that's mm-hmm. how All he right. sees it. They. <laughs> <laughs> he was also married with my wife. I mean, it's but, fine. It's a friendship it, it type relationship. It was actually really, really beautiful. Yeah, it was a beautiful. And I'm not like an animal person, but yeah. But he talks about in, the emotional intelligence of Tuco. Anyway, the his name is Tuco, yeah, that's the a very that right? famous Tuco. Yeah, yeah. All right. that's a very famous well, one. We'll fill yeah. that. Um, I had never, <laughs> I had never heard of it. But I think I've talked about emotional intelligence of my dog Dave. Yes. At, uh, yes. in this podcast before. Yeah, yes. yeah. So this is what I know. Yes, yes, you have Kirsten. <laughs> this is what I know about birds. That's what I was thinking of when I said they dogs. live a hell of a long time. They, birds. Yeah, or they can. Yeah, like yeah. they could outlive you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's all I, I mean, like. people who know parrots, and, and I don't know if it was that one or if it was a different book, said like they shouldn't really be sold as pets because yeah. they, they live so long yeah. and they are equal to, not equal to intelligence, but they are intelligent enough that yeah. you can't treat them like an <laughs> object, right? Like no. you have to treat them like a person. And it's See, similar, like if you, um, there's another book called Wesley and Me, which is about a lady who ends up uh, uh, taking in a baby owl and their relationship and how she finds the same kind of thing is that you can't just kind of treat, you have to be very specific how you treat them because they're special creatures. And then also there's Soul of the Octopus by Cy Montgomery, which is about... The guy with an octopus. That was about? No, this is (laughs) octopus that lives in an aquarium. Oh, okay. But um, studying the octopus and the sort of things that we're discovering about exactly how intelligent octopuses seem to be. That we probably shouldn't be eating them. My my favorite yeah. octopus story is the one from Australia where they had him in a in an aquarium mm. and he disappeared. Yeah. And it turned out, like I guess from security footage or whatever, they figured out he had figured out how to squirt water out of the tank and he hit uh like the an alarm sensor or something else to turn off the power so he could actually get out of he crawled out of his uh aquarium, made it to the sewer line and left. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. No. They, I feel they, so bad. They can for solve puzzles. Eating they can, octopus when I was in Estonia. They can open jars. So they were probably dumber it was octopuses. So there. delicious. Octopi. Octopuses. Octopodi. It's no. no. <laughs> Is it? No. It's. You not. remember? We oh, read that I in a book. We discussed this. Whole thing about it's a Greek. It's a Greek suffix, a, suffix that, or is it a whatever? Right. Just say octopus. Octopodi. No. Octopodes. Octopuses. Wow. Well. Anyway, we're drifting away. We are drifting, drifting away. No, we're not. And it's very, very interesting. I think maybe the ancient Egyptians had it right. When the pharaoh died, they killed all their pets and buried them with them. That is not <gasps> what is right. I'm just saying that maybe if, you know, if a <laughs> parrot's going to outlive me or a turtle, turtles can live for hundreds of years. Yes. Just saying. They don't get to? <laughs> I don't know. Uh <laughs> Moving right along, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, technology in the book that may be time um, period accurate or maybe not. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to pass judgment on toothpaste, except that Eli <laughs> discovered toothpaste in the course of the book, and he thought it was the best thing I loved, ever. I love the whole toothpaste thing. And oh toothbrush. My gosh. Yeah, it was. It was quite lovely. It was a funny. That was funny in the scene where he was trying to lose weight in the restaurant, and they're trying to tell him why are you not eating? You're supposed to get full. Like there's yeah. some yeah. very good comedy moments. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering, do you guys have a memory of discovering something new and delightful when it was new and delightful at the time, or new and delightful to you? But now uh, it's everywhere. Something like toothpaste. I hope you don't say toothpaste. Mm-hmm. What is toothpaste? <laughs> Willow Place uh, WPG on Instagram said, the iPhone, deep sigh, mm. exclamation mark. Mm. Yeah, something. Yeah. When I was a child in, I'm going to say elementary school, the local Kmart had uh, Commodore 64s on display. And uh, the Commodore 64, you could write basic programming language right into it and it would run the program. So I went to the library and got books on basic and I learned how to do some simple basic programming and I would go to the Kmart and I would type in a little program that would like repeat Dennis is awesome or something like that (laughs) over and over again. And I just loved that. It was years before we actually got a home computer at home and well before they were the ubiquitous thing that we see these days. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was just so entranced by uh, personal computers. Mm. I loved that scene in the book where he and um, the the woman, one of the women that he meets in a hotel, and he introduces the, the toothpaste to her and they mm-hmm. stand there and they're brushing yes. their teeth side by side. And yes. he's sort of saying to himself, I am living a life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just yes. thought. Yeah. Oh. yeah. He's very it, sweet. It's 
it's very it's interesting because there's a couple movies where or and shows and stuff where that's like a bonding moment between two characters. So it was neat that it worked its way into there yeah. because it's like a pop culture thing. Mm. That's another one of the things I loved about Eli as a character, though, is that he he lived a hard life, but he took pleasure in all sorts of little things. And yeah. I think at some point he said something like that. It was like the little things that or no, his mom had said small victories, I guess. And so he repeated that to himself when he had one of these small moments that he liked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, and DeWitt said, uh, too, that he wanted to sort of introduce some, sort of some of these kind of contemporary themes, like with Eli and his, the obsession with the toothpaste and sort of that cleanliness, oral hygiene, but also like his whole thing about the dieting, too. Mm-hmm. Like some of these things that I don't think <laughs> normally work their way into a Western either, right? right? right. Which um, might, might have been one of the reasons, I mean, I thought maybe he's almost... Like is DeWitt kind of like using the Western? Is he kind of slumming it, you know, by using it as the structure to, which is, I mean, fine, but like, let's be honest about it. I don't know. Like you said, he didn't set out to write a Western, but this yeah. thing came out that people are calling a Western. Like would he call it a Western? I don't know. We're talking about genre again. I apologize to <laughs> I can talk about genre all day. Until the cows come home. Until the cows come home. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. No, but I think it's, it's yeah. a major topic in anything concerning this book is, yeah, did he write it as a Western? Did he write it because he loved Westerns, but he wanted to explore other things? Did he want to sort of remix of ideas and mm. see how they mash up together and see if they can work together? I don't know. Personally, I think he just wanted to string together a series of amazing quotes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the there quotes. are no, so many lines. Of yeah. Can, yeah. I, can I read one of my favorite yeah. passages? Mm-hmm. Yes, go ahead. After they had killed like Mayfield's men in that like that town with the hotel with the you know the, mm. the guy, and they're making him give him their his money. He says, uh, and and Mayfield is really like going on about how hard done by he is. He describes his inaction and cowardice as laziness. Charlie said. And with five men dead, I said, he describes our overtaking his riches as easy. <laughs> he has a describing problem. Yeah, he's a yes. describing yeah. problem. That's that right. Was, yeah. that There's was really so good. many, yeah, uh, yeah in yeah. the or, conversations. Yeah. Like, uh, or what about when Charlie was talking to Eli about sort of the, you know, remember what happened? Or do you remember when father oh, died? That was so amazing. And it was his like whole big long story. And Eli was so little. And yes, but he remembers that his mother, you know, the father was beating up the mother. And then Charlie mm-hmm. went in and shot him. And they and then he had forgotten that Eli was out in the sun. And that's how you got yeah. freckles. Yeah. Yeah. Eli. Like that that's was the it. point of him and telling that story. And that's the point of that yeah. story. It's that was like, such an amazing passage because yeah, you got yeah. that backstory but for them they're reminiscing about all the stuff around it yeah, yeah, yeah. i was very impressed at that particular passage i'm glad you brought that up yeah. that's yeah. wonderful yeah mm-hmm. yeah i just wanted to do a couple more shout outs yeah. to some some more um folks who ov jewett underscore library i just said absolutely love this book and daver I'm, music I'm the is I know, I know. is life okay. said fantastic choice Hand clap emoji. Mm. <laughs> would it make you feel better if I went on record saying that I'm not the biggest Margaret Atwood fan? Uh because no, it's okay. I mean, it's okay to like thing, not like yeah, things that a lot of people. It's, of. it's different because this is the only Patrick DeWitt book I've read, so I don't want to say I'm not a Patrick DeWitt fan mm-hmm. uh, uh, because I haven't read anything else by him, and, right. and he seems like a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just this particular. I didn't invite right. him over for dinner. Sure. Well, yeah, okay. tell yeah. me how that was. He passed the dinner test. <laughs> Um, you know, we're talking about technology and when something's popular, often it gets turned into a movie Mm -hmm. and this book has kind of an interesting history of being made into a movie because, uh, Patrick DeWitt, as you mentioned in his bio, had some Hollywood connections Mm -hmm. and one of his Hollywood connections is John C. Riley. Yeah, because he wrote a screenplay. Now I can't remember what it was called. It was called Her- Terry or something. And somehow John C. Riley was involved with that. And um, so he knew John C. Riley. Yeah. And yeah. Well, I was surprised or I made note that in the uh, acknowledgments in the book, one of the people that Patrick DeWitt thanks is mm-hmm. John C. Riley. So he was mm-hmm. obviously involved or knew him mm-hmm. before a movie. And sure enough, a couple of years ago, a movie was made. Of mm-hmm. the sisters brothers, and uh, I wonder if anyone has seen it. I have not. No, it's waiting on my table. I brought it home. Oh, okay. I haven't had time to watch it. I wanted to see it, but I just didn't fit it into my schedule. Yeah. Although I, I have read a little bit about it. So, uh, someone on our Facebook group, uh, Amir Pulio, said, 
uh, he thought it held up very well. Translating to the screen, he said, plus John C. Riley is great. Yes, I do like John C. Riley, mm-hmm. so I feel yeah. like that's Although the the thing choice. that I caught when I was reading about it was that they switched the age of the brothers. Like, oh. Eli is the older brother in the movie, oh. and Charlie is the younger that's okay, because yeah, because I was looking at the casting, and it yeah. didn't make any sense to me because Joaquin, Joaquin yeah. Phoenix is Charlie. Yeah, uh, and uh, so that's very interesting. I wonder, you know, and for me with the movie, like, okay, John C. Riley, sure, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, who I think plays uh, Morris. Who he play Morris. Sh- w- okay, you know, and uh, Joaquin Phoenix, sure. If they're all in a movie by themselves, yeah, uh, that's not a barrier to me, mm-hmm. but. Putting those three guys together in a movie, <laughs> like there, there isn't really like it's like forms a triangle of meh, huh. you know. Like it's just like that's like, interesting because it totally sold me. I was I like, know, what? I was gonna say Jack Gyllenhaal's in it or yeah. Jake, whatever his name is. Jake, is that oh, sorry, it wrong? Jake. I said no, it wrong. no, I said it wrong. Maggie's, uh, Maggie's yes, bro- Maggie's brother there. slash sister. Gyllenhaal. Slash, yeah, they're brother and sister. Gyllenhaal. Who plays yeah. Warm? Oh, uh, Reese Ahmed. Mm. I'm also probably saying that name wrong. Mm. Um, I know nothing about the movie. I saw the trailer last night, and wouldn't you know, it looks pretty darn good. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know what to think now. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very interested Spiraling. to see where they took it, because the the book as written would be way too long as a movie. Oh. So clearly they had to chisel stuff away. Yeah. The, the review that I came across of it talked about it specifically as uh, addressing that whole masculinity but vulnerability and talking about emotions and and stuff like that so i think they kept that Mm. uh core of that in there good um so i i'm still curious to watch it and we'll probably watch it later because i want to know how they handled it i I like how we talk about a movie before we see it but Mm -hmm. uh, i feel like if i watch the movie it will be a similar experience to watching the movie uh, of Remains of the Day Mm -hmm. and that how so much of the novel Remains of the Day was uh, Stevens talking directly to the reader, Mm -hmm. just like Eli talking directly. But the Mm -hmm. movie, of course, is not that. It's just a lot of smoldering looks between (laughs) Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. (laughs) And so it'll be interesting to see, you know, uh, how they get the the language, the prose that we've commented on, onto the page of the screenplay. Mm -hmm. Like, is it more talking like more dialogue between Eli well the book Charlie. is really dialogue heavy yeah. right dialogue heavy but yeah also a lot of eli's thoughts yeah mm-hmm. that's have, true have to. but anyway yeah. i mean it sounds like the movie is also very popular like, with those who have read the book yeah so, and yeah. those who haven't read the book there like i've the met a lot of people who yeah. like the movie but hadn't yeah. read the book so i said what well, listen to the podcast <laughs> <laughs> well have we have we talked about the sisters brothers <laughs> Uh, enough, or I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to slow it down, but I'm just wondering if we if we have anything else we wanted to say about it before we move on to. I, I do want to say uh, or, or describe one more quote. Oh yes, oh yeah. And uh, end off with a quote. This is Dennis. so quotable. This whole book. Yeah. But like when they got to San Francisco and that stranger is telling them how expensive everything is, and the guy with the chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah That's right. the guy with the like chicken. why? And, yeah. and Charlie's like, only a moron would pay these prices. Yeah. I agree, said the man. 100% I agree. And I am happy to welcome you to a town peopled in morons exclusively. (laughs) Furthermore, I hope that your transformation to moron is not an unpleasant experience. (laughs) It could be a a prequel to Tales of the City. (laughs) Well, yeah, even back then, the place is incredibly expensive. And uh, it never got over that, apparently. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, I, I'm glad I could uh, get everyone's opinions on the book. You've given me a lot to think about. And maybe I will give it another read down the road. Yeah. 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 A year or two from now. Yeah. 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 Give it maybe, time. maybe I'll watch the movie and then mm-hmm. down the road I might revisit it. Um, <laughs> well, and now I'd like to say again to our most awkwardly worded segment. Can you tell me about a book, another book you would also like? Could you? I could. Oh, Can I yes. go first? Uh, I know. Sure. Erica, it, I wonder I if we have the same one. I just, because I just mine thought. Is really. Oh, I can't wait to I, see. I just thought, because if you're going to just, you know, maybe wait a little while before you read The Sisters Brothers. Yeah. Maybe you might want to read Patrick DeWitt's 2018 book, oh, okay, okay. The French Exit, which oh. I liked even more wow. than The Sisters Brothers. Low um, bar. Okay. I, again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when you don't like when, something, you just don't ooh, stop it's talking fine, about It's it. fine, Patrick. It's not personal. It's got nothing to do with a Western. And this is what I like about... It's an Eastern. You, you, can, <laughs> you, can write, you can write a reproachful letter to Patrick Dewitt. Yeah. Yeah. And invite him for dinner. Yeah. I mean, Let's I, want, talk. I want us to be friends. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a nice guy. That's all I'm saying. 
Yeah, this just wasn't your cup of tea. It hurts me that I didn't like it. Yeah. I've, <laughs> had, okay, that, so I've try, had that experience. Try, try the French okay, accent. Lay it on okay? me. What's about? Okay, so it's about Malcolm and Francis. So Francis is the mother. Malcolm's the son. They're a dysfunctional, rich, pampered mother and son duo. So it's another sort of duo. They move from New York City to Paris to escape scandal and bankruptcy. And the plan is is to just spend all of the money, their money, until Francis dies, like to die before Hmm. the money runs out. So it's sort of, it's been described as this tragedy of of manners. And it, you know, again, there's like a lot of sort of funny moments in it. And yet there's also a lot of heartbreaking parts as well. We certainly don't have the same violence. They're an incredibly eccentric pair. And also lots of super interesting characters are introduced. Wonderful dialogue. Again, it's really, really well written. There's not, I guess, a ton of plot. Not the way this, he, you can tell he did really focus on plot in mm-hmm. this book because, I mean, there was a, yeah. It was a page this, turner for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this thing. is a page, page turner as well. And what I really liked about this book too is that the main sort of force is Francis, the 65-year-old um, mother, this formidable woman, uh, which was sort of a nice change from the, the, the super masculine energy of, of the sisters' brothers. So I would suggest you uh, you read The French Exit and, and, and see what you think. But if you liked The Sisters' Brothers and you liked Patrick DeWitt's um, writing, try the, the French Exit. Well, I'll tell you, I like the idea of a French Exit, which, mm. as I understand it, is if you go to a party... You leave without saying goodbye. Mm-hmm. You just slip away. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And That's my favorite thing. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm probably too chicken to actually do it in real life. But boy, there have been some parties I've been where I just love to do it. Uh, but anyway, that's that's great. Mm-hmm. Erica, do you want to go second? I would. Okay. I'd, yes, I'm sorry. It's I'm sorry first. for that. I'm, I'm just. I'm, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm s- We're upending the genre. That's we, yeah, we really are. Whoa. So when I was reading this book and I was picturing the two of them riding around and being sort of like bedraggled and stuff, I like I've read something so like this. And then I finally remembered it's uh, Days Without End by Sebastian Barry. Amazing book. It's also about a, a special unique relationship between two men in the 1850s in the American frontier. It has the same sort of comic prose, the black humor about life. Some passages are brutal. Um, So watch out for that. But they're balanced out by kind of even more celebratory passages than are even that are in here. So this is the um, the blurb for Days Without End. Thomas McNulty, aged barely 17 and having fled the Great Famine in Ireland, signs up for the U.S. Army in the 1850s. With his brother in arms, John Cole, Thomas goes on to fight in the Indian Wars against the Sioux and Yurok and ultimately the Civil War. Orphans of terrible hardships themselves, the men find these days to be vivid and alive despite the horrors they see and are complicit in. Moving from the plains of Wyoming to Tennessee, it's an intensely poignant story of two men and the makeshift family they create. Like with Sisters Brothers, the interest is really in the absolutely remarkable characters. Cole, specifically, is one of those characters that stays with you. And who they want to be is very surprising. And how they end up wanting to live their lives is very surprising. So Mm. I highly Mm. recommend Days Without End by Sebastian Barry if you like The Sisters Brothers. Wow, that sounds like a really good recommendation. Like exactly for this book. Wow, that's great. Yes, did you want to tell us about another book that we might like? No, I... (laughs) I am no. I am upending this by because <laughs> I, I picked three books uh, <laughs> partly because unlike, one and then two more unlike Erica I couldn't think of anything that really matched this in the Sisters Brothers is one of those books I haven't read anything quite like before so I thought of three different areas you could go if you mm. like this if you liked the whole idea of a western the traditional western I'll recommend Off the Mangrove Coast by Louis Lemoore. We have a few copies at WPL. I read it many years ago, uh, so I don't remember all the details, but it's short stories, and I remember enjoying the descriptions of the West. It's more of an adventure than a Western, the stories that are in this particular collection. But uh, if you like that, that would be a good choice. If you enjoyed the backdrop of the California Gold Rush but wanted to hear more about what it was like for women, you might Mm -hmm. consider They Saw the Elephant, Women in the California Gold Rush by Joanne Levy. It's accounts taken from journals, diaries, and letters that tell the stories of the women traveling to and making their way in California during the gold rush, 
which provides a fuller picture of life in that times and it's not just men panning gold in the in Being the crazy prospectors. Glowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Glowing at night. I have not read it myself, but the reviews are favorable and we do have a copy. And if you like the idea of riding long distances on a mission where you intend to shoot somebody <laughs> and enjoy the somewhat otherworldly feel of the story, you might consider The Gunslinger by Stephen King. Oh, yeah. It's about Roland, the last gunslinger who has been chasing the man in black for many years. It combines Western fiction, fantasy, sci-fi, and horror, and it's the first volume of the Dark Tower series. So if you like it, you have a lot of stuff to read after it, too. And those are my three. Excellent. Wow. Excellent. Oh, Dennis, I was going to be cross with you for not following the rules, but you redeemed yourself at the end with a Stephen King pick. So I don't know, I don't we've, know what to think now. What, what a roller followed. coaster I went through. Oh, my God. We've you never don't followed. don't want to see a cross Trevor. Uh, no, no. We've but, never followed our rules. No. It's like we came up with them, and but then we I'm, never actually I'm, I'm bringing them. it back from that uh, deviance to, <laughs> to, to, to one, one book now um, called The Last Crossing by Guy Vanderhaag, mm. a Canadian author from Saskatoon. If you want to call the Sisters Brothers a Western, but not really, or a Western, but kind of something more, I would also call The Last Crossing a similar book. It tells the story of an English missionary, Simon Gaunt, who disappears in a blizzard in Montana. And so the patriarch of the family, which is back in England, sends the other two brothers over to find out what happened to the missing brother. So there's brother dynamic it takes place in the west and the two brothers there's charles who's a painter and kind of an, an artist and then addington who is a soldier so you can assume or predict that they would have different interests and different sort of perspectives and it's a fantastic novel basically you could boil down to let's go see what happened to our brother but the the people they meet along the way and the the stories it's very well written beautiful prose and uh, I highly recommend The Last Crossing by Guy Vanderhaeck. Very good. Mm. Excellent. <laughs> well, now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, the part of each show where we, the hosts, boil down our most prevalent thoughts of the past month into one word. One word, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got one this uh, time. Uh, who wants to start us off? <laughs> Um, I'll start so uh, <laughs> so you can see I've just got the one. Uh, in the story, Eli described finding settlements along their route that didn't exist when they had last gone by that way. The gold rush led to lots of new developments and settlements and towns that were built rapidly and without the level of care that most of us would want for infrastructure we tend to use for a while. So in a word, they were built rather slapdash. Mm. And that's my word. That's good. That's good. The Merriam-Webster defines it as haphazard or slipshod. The Cambridge Dictionary says, done or made in a hurried and careless way. Merriam-Webster says this about the term's origins. The first known use of slapdash in English came in 1679 from the British poet and dramatist John Dryden. He used it as an adverb in his play, The Kind Keeper. Down I put the note slapdash. Mm -hmm. The Oxford English Dictionary defines this sense as part of, with or as with, a slap and a dash perhaps suggesting the notion of an action such as painting performed with a quick, imprecise movements. Over a hundred years later, the word acquired the sense in which we are more familiar today, describing something done in a hasty, careless, or haphazard manner. I like the word slapdash because it's so evocative. Just hearing it puts a picture in my mind of something rushed and careless, full of energy perhaps, but not a lot of solidity. It also fills my mind with thoughts of things built or made quickly because we need them quickly followed by years and years of dealing with the defects resulting from our rushed approach and wishing we had spent more time to build them properly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Social Slap. commentary. Slapdash. Uh, Slapdash. It, it sounds like it's fun to say. It is. Yeah. Uh, also, the uh, Urban Dictionary uh, has a definition wherein you slap someone and run away quickly. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was going to be something else. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually, it's usually no, wasn't, there, wasn't there a thing on the Conan O'Brien, the slap snack, slap where it was, it, it was just like a footage of Andy Richter going along and like uh, slapping snacks out of people's hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Google that, everybody. I don't, I don't know if it's up on YouTube or uh, popular video uh, service, but it's fun. All right. Can I go next, guys? Sure. Mine is very short. Um, I didn't have like a big word or a lot to say about any specific word, but I wanted to give a shout out to a very important to me, but low profile word that sounds weirder the more you say it. And that's thanks. Thanks. Um, the first known use of thanks predates the 12th century, which was older than I thought. That's pretty old for yeah. thanks. That sounds kind of slangy to me. 
And it comes, yeah, all the way from the Latin through High German, through Old English, through Middle English. So uh, I say it a lot, but in the spirit of mindfulness, I wanted to acknowledge and appreciate the word thanks. Oh. Thanks. 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 But the way you say it, the weirder thanks. It's, it sounds. Thanks. thanks. Well, and also, thanks. you know, uh, Tom Hanks, T. Hanks, T thanks. Hanks. So, That's weird. Yes. Hmm. Um, he's a weird guy. Yeah. <laughs> that would be um, his email address if he worked for the city. That's right. <laughs> thanks. thanks at <gasps> um, I also found a thing that I didn't know where it's like a 10 with an X is like shorthand for thanks because it's like tanks. Oh. So I had I, I hadn't hadn't found that before. So there you go. No. No, I'm hit. You young people with your emojis and your I Googled shortcuts. it. <laughs> now I'm now I can feel young again. Well, something that I love about this crew, this team here, and I think something that I've been missing in my life these days are the shenanigans Yay. that we come up with. It's been a bit of a serious time these days and serious at work trying to, you know, keep everyone safe. Um, so it's always nice to get together with uh, with this crew and um, have some shenanigans. So shenanigan mm -hmm. is my word uh, from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Actually, the definition is a devious trick used especially <laughs> for an underhand purpose. <laughs> um, it's but it's of. also known as high-spirited or mischievous activity. Like a slapdash. <laughs> like a slapdash. <laughs> <laughs> Etymologists have some theories about the origin of the word, but no one has been able to prove them. Ooh, I love but that. the word shenanigans seems to arise first during Gold Rush era California. Oh, oh. sweet. The earliest known use of the word in print appeared in April 25th, 1855, issue of San Francisco's Town Talk. And I guess there were lots of Irish folks. Oh. You were talking about, uh, no, somebody was mentioning the Irish. Irish. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there were lots of Irish men uh, in the gold fields. So some of them say it's Irish in origin from. Uh, Wait, did it's you like, say gold fields? Yeah. Is that a thing? Gold fields. That's what it said. Uh, fields in of this, gold. Like, the fields of the gold. gold. It's in the ground. Right. Rivers, gold rivers. rivers. What was Sting talking, uh, like, uh, literally? That's probably exactly what he was I thinking I thought he was of. probably talking about <laughs> canola. <laughs> <laughs> or wheat. Is it wheat? Fields uh, of barley. Fields of barley. It's also in the... In the yeah, so, all right, stop I'm, your I'm shenanigans. Yeah, really. Let's get back to um, the your nerd word. Irish in origin <laughs> from the word shenakim, mm. which sounds like shenanigans, uh, meaning I play tricks or I play like a fox. Whoa. Uh. I play like a fox. <laughs> uh, this, this episode's getting racy. <laughs> Others like a, cite like the Spanish like word shanada, meaning trick or deceit. And then there's also <laughs> Come on now. Schnigelei. <laughs> German one. slang for a trick. I had never heard that. Schnigelei. Anyway, given the international flavor of early California, it does seem probable that it's Irish. So the underhanded trick uh, is sort of the oldest definition but now we use it a lot more to use like to be like tricky or questionable practices like political shenanigans but also as high-spirited behavior as in youthful shenanigans hmm. like here around the time to read table <laughs> we're so youthful <laughs> oh, that's great well my word is also short uh, but it comes out of things we've been reading it seems like we can't leave san francisco behind oh. and uh I should, oh, I should update everybody. I'm on book six of the Tales of the City. Hey. I feel like now I should have started taking pledges at the beginning of the summer yeah. or something. Like, I feel like I'm on the home stretch now. And, you, you know, we fundraised, fundraised for, something. for something positive. Uh, mm -hmm. But the word I picked is aquiline. Mm -hmm. And I've only heard this word referred to in descriptions of Sherlock Holmes talking about his aquiline nose. nose. Yeah. And I always, in my, I never looked it up. I, I just, in my head, I said, well, aquiline must mean like, pointy or or long and narrow but it came up again in the latest tales of the sea book that i'm reading where someone's nose was described as aquiline so i like well this is a sign i need to actually look it up and surprisingly it does not mean pointy it means according to miriam webster curving like an eagle's beak so it's curvy and pointy that's what an aquiline nose is or resembling an eagle an eagle <laughs> an equal eagle <laughs> and uh, it comes from the latin word aquila which is uh, latin for eagle. 
Oh, see, I always had thought it had something to do with like being like aqua, like water, whatever. Snotty. Um, right. You know, no, you know, like, um, <laughs> oh, like a aerodynamic or yeah. like water dynamic, whatever that's called. I know what like you mean. Dolphins. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like a, yeah, like sleek. Yeah. A dolphin know. nose. Dolphin, like, that's what I always thought. A bottle nose? Bottle nose dolphin? dolphin? Bottle nose dolphin? I don't know. I always thought it was Sherlock like Holmes referred his to when nose. they were talking about like, you know, Romans and their aquiline oh, yeah. noses. So eagles, like they're not really crooked, their noses, are they eagles? Like no, they're it's pointy. like this. They go, no, but it doesn't sort of go like this. I always thought it was sort of like a bit more round. No, for, for the listening audience, it goes like this means a person <laughs> is, is gesturing with their finger kind of out at an angle and sharply back. A point. <laughs> Well, you know, we could oh, actually yeah. look up pictures of we eagles. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, yeah. you'll have to, anyway, you'll have to like link smooth, it. It's got to be that smooth like, profile. Let's, let's yeah. leave you to uh, think about that for a month. Because <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> that's all the time we have. <laughs> for time. Uh, thank you so much, dear readers, for tuning in to this episode of Time to Read. For September, join us as we read Stranger in the Woods by Michael, Michael Finkel. Finkel. Michael Finkel. <laughs> thank you very much. Get in on the conversation by finding us on Facebook or Instagram or all those other great places where you can find us. Don't miss a single episode by subscribing to Time to Read wherever you get your podcasts. If you've enjoyed this, please give us a rate and review. And until next time, make sure you find Time, time to, to Read and Shenanigans. <laughs>